Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Thursday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm nearing the end of my two weeks worth of teaching on self-centeredness, the source of all grief. And if you've listened to this teaching, I think it struck a chord with you. You know, this is something that is absolutely true. The Holy Spirit is trying to get these points across to all of us, and yet very, very, very seldom do you hear somebody really talk about humbling yourself and putting God and other people first. I mean, our whole world is based on do whatever it takes for you to succeed, and if you don't take care of yourself, nobody else will. And that is absolutely the wrong approach. That is completely opposite what Jesus taught. Jesus came teaching us that the way up is down. To be really great in the kingdom of God, you've got to humble yourself. Jesus humbled himself. He was their Lord and Master, and yet in the 13th chapter of the book of John, he humbled himself and washed the disciples' feet, even the feet of Judas Iscariot, who he knew that that same night was going to betray him. And he humbled himself and ministered unto them. Man, it's just completely opposite the way all of us have been taught. And I've been trying to get at this. And I've been saying that it's our own self-centeredness that makes us so angry. If we could get to where we look through God's eyes at people and recognize that every one of these people, I don't care what they're doing to you, is somebody that Jesus died for. And at one time, this person, you know, had a... uh, Revelation of God's what the scripture teaches in Romans chapter 1. And if we could see through God's eyes, it would help diffuse your anger. You could tell where they're coming from. And that's what Proverbs 13.10 says, Only by pride comes contention. So I've already been dealing with this for nearly two weeks. What I want to do today is basically say, why is it that all of us seem to be so self-centered? You know, I don't have to spend a lot of time teaching a person to be self-centered. You come into this world self-centered. I know that my kids, you know, we loved them. We treated them properly, raised them the best we knew how. And yet we didn't have to teach our kids to go over and take this toy and be selfish and say it's mine. I mean, that's one of the very first words that a kid learns. They just learn to be selfish. Why is it that this is so common? It's because we were born into this world with a fallen human nature. Look at this passage. This is David that said this in Psalms chapter 51. And in verse 5, he says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, this is not talking about that he was born out of wedlock, that it was an adulterous relationship or any of this. It's just talking about that all of us were conceived and born into a sinful world. Our parents were sinners. And some people may take offense at that, but I'm saying that Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we beget children in our own image and they are born with a sin nature. I could spend two or three programs talking about this. I'm not going to go into detail. I don't believe that that sin nature is imputed are held against us until we reach what some people call an age of accountability where we knowingly continue to transgress. And if you were to die before that time, uh, even a child who was born with a sin nature doesn't have it imputed unto them or held against them. They go into the presence of the Lord. But there comes a time when we pass that mark and when that happens, this sin nature revives and we die And if you were to die after you have willingly participated and embraced that sin nature, then your sins are held against you. So anyway, there's a lot more that could be said about that. But my point that I'm trying to get across is that, see, we all came into this world sinful. We were born with a sinful nature. Look at this passage of Scripture in Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 2, he says, "...wherein in time past..." Ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Notice that this is talking about that we all walked under this spirit of the world, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. In verse 3, among 
whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. These verses, along with many, many others, show that we were born in sin. There is a belief among some people that all people are basically good and there is a propensity or a tendency towards sin. But the scripture actually teaches that we were all born basically bad with a tendency or a propensity towards good. And God is constantly drawing us and he is constantly trying to improve and amplify the good in people. But at the core, people are sinners. And if you just indulge yourself, if you run your own life, it's going to go bad. I remember when I was in high school, they made us read uh, Lord of the Flies. And I actually protested it. And I, uh, you know, I didn't think it was a godly thing, but they made me read it. And anyway, basically it was about these kids that were stuck on an island and left to themselves. They did all of the same things that were done in uh, mainline society. They established a hierarchy, the haves and the have-nots. They hurt people. They killed people. There was stealing. There was lying. There was sexual immorality. There was just everything. And it wasn't modeled. It just came out of them. And did you know what? That mankind basically is evil and we need to be redeemed. This is why you can't just go, you know, talk to the terrorists because after all, they're really good at the core. And if you can just get past that. No, we're all really bad at the core. And without Jesus, we're all in a mess. So I say all of this basically to explain why self-centeredness is so pervasive because we were all born selfish. You know what? You didn't care that your mother had just been up all night long giving birth to you and went through terrible pain. Who knows all of the things that happened. And then the nine months prior to that and the, and the way that she had to separate herself and curtail some of her activities and, you know, on and on and on it goes. Just all that it takes to get a child into this earth. And yet after all of that, that child doesn't care that the mother's been up all night, that it could be in the middle of everything. That baby will cry and wake everybody else up. When it wants to be fed, it lets everybody know about it. When it wants its diaper changed, it lets everybody know about it. You could bring a baby into a church service and it doesn't give a rip that anybody else is there, that anybody else is seeking God and needs to listen to the preacher and they're trying to concentrate. That baby will throw a fit. That baby will direct everybody's attention, drown out the preacher. A child is 100% self-centered. It doesn't know that any other person exists in the world. You all came into the world the exact same way. We were all born self-centered. And you know what? For a weak old baby, that's not so bad. But the problem is, is when you're 30, 40, 50, 60 years old, and you still have that attitude, you still... Just think about yourself. You don't know that anybody else has any needs. It's all about you. And you are going to make everybody's life miserable if something goes contrary to what you want. You just make a mess and let everybody know about it. Hey, man, I know this isn't blessing some of you, but I'm trying to be blunt. I'm telling you the truth because I love you. And I'm saying that there were many people who came into this world self-centered and sad to say they were never told the truth, and never trained out of being a self-centered brat. You know, a child, the, I've used these verses where Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, and he says, if you find your life, you'll lose it. But if you'll lose your life for the gospel's sake, then you'll find it. In other words, it's not about you. It's about putting God first, putting other people first. And when you get to where you live to be a blessing to others, then you will be blessed yourself. And Jesus taught us that. He told us to turn the other cheek. He told us to give and it shall be given unto you. He said it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And on and on and on we could go with all of these things that are countering this self-centeredness. A parent is supposed to train your child out of that. You're supposed to teach the child that, you know, it's actually better to give. Why don't you let your sibling have this toy? Why don't you let them 
have the best food. Why don't you let them do this? It's actually better. You'll enjoy it more if you learn to promote and put other people first. We're supposed to teach our children this. But you know what happens? Because most of us are self-centered ourselves. You'll be in a grocery store and a kid wants a piece of candy or something. Say, no, you'll ruin your supper. You can't have it. And the kid said, I want it. And you say, no, you can't have it. And the kid, if they're willing to just make a spectacle of themselves, will fall down on the floor, scream, yell. And you know what the average person does? Instead of doing what's best for that child and teaching them that this is not the way to live. It is not all about you. You need to learn to submit to other people. You need to learn that you, there are right and wrong things to do. Rather than use that, take them outside, give them a spanking, and do what's necessary to train them out of this self-centered behavior because most parents themselves are self-centered and they're thinking, what's everybody thinking about me? And they're watching this little kid throw a fit and they're going to think I'm a terrible parent. And so rather than deal with it, we do what is easiest on self, not what's best for the child, but what's easiest on self. We'll give them the candy and we'll say, here, just shut up. Don't say anything. And you know what you've just done? You've reinforced self-centeredness. You've taught them that if you're willing to make a big enough fit and a big enough fool of yourself, you can manipulate people. You can get whatever you want. And you know what? The child just grows up learning this. And now we've got people that are in their 40s and in their 50s that when their mate doesn't do something, they just throw a fit. They make it so miserable for everybody. I mean, people walk in and they have to walk on eggshells because they know that mom is upset. And she just punishes people and does things, or the father, or the child, or whatever. And we've got people that are adult brats that are throwing temper tantrums. They no longer fall on the floor. They no longer cry or suck their thumb. But they'll sit there and turn the cold shoulder to you. They will give you looks that could kill. They will do things. And all it is is an adult temper tantrum. Self didn't get what it wanted. And self is going to throw a fit. And sad to say... Many people still will respond to that. They just don't like the conflict, and so they will let you have your way and stuff, and it just reinforces it. And we've got a, we got a, a group of adult brats that are literally just, it's all about them, and they want their way. And when they don't get their way, well, then I'm going to go get me somebody else. And we just, all of this self-centeredness, is just still pervasive because you were born that way and you have to make a deliberate attempt to turn on self. First of all, you cannot change this whole way that it operates until you recognize it's wrong. And I spent two weeks on this program trying to say that this self-centered existence, self-promoting, where you are the center of the universe, where you defend yourself, where you act like there is no God who said, I will avenge you and take care of you, and you've got to handle it yourself. I'm just saying that you make a very poor Holy Spirit and that you are not sufficient to run your own life and to do these things. And you will never turn from it until, first of all, you hear somebody say this. Romans chapter 10, verse 17, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And sad to say, I just don't know, I don't know very many people, very, very few people who are standing up and boldly proclaiming that you are not the most important thing in your life, that God should be more important to you than you are. Other people should be more important. That's just not said very much. And, because, and it's complete through the Word. I've used dozens, maybe, maybe close to 100 scriptures I've used during these two weeks teaching against a self-centered, self-promotion where self is God. I've used lots of scriptures and most people don't ever hear these. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. If you don't hear it, it's impossible for you to turn from it. So the very first thing is to get hold of these truths. I encourage you to get this little booklet where I've got all of these scriptures written out and you can study it in detail. And you need to start learning from the Word that it's wrong. You'll never change until, first of all, an alternative lifestyle is presented to you to where God and other people are more important than yourself. Man, that's powerful. So somebody's got to say it. That's the reason I'm being bold. We're 
covering half of the world with these television programs, and I'm shouting it from the rooftops around the world that you are not the most important thing in your life. You know, Paul had this revelation. And I won't take time to turn over and read these scriptures, but you ought to study the book of Philippians. This was written from prison to people that Paul said that he had no other people who were like-minded with him, who sent multiple times trying to help him. These people were his partners. Philippians chapter 1, verse 5, the Greek word is koinonia, and it means partners. And they, they were people that were close to Paul. He said, I thank God every time I think of you. And yet these people had heard that Paul was in prison. He was in transit to Rome. He got shipwrecked. And because of it, it took him a couple of years to make the trip. They didn't have email, phones, and things the way that we do today. So they weren't sure what his situation was. And when they heard that he finally made it to Rome, immediately they began to send things to help him and to be a blessing to him. And Paul knew that they were concerned about him. So here's how he tried to alleviate their concerns. He says, don't worry, because the things that have happened unto me, such as being arrested for two years in Jerusalem, then two years in transit, and then shipwrecked on an island, and finally winding up in Rome facing possible execution, four years of just nothing but tragedy, and Paul was trying to comfort the people who were worried about him, and he says, don't worry, because everything that has happened to me has happened rather to the furtherance of the gospel. Because now all of the people in Herod's, I mean in Caesar's household, have heard the gospel and he was rejoicing and saying, surely this is going to comfort you to know that people are being one to the Lord and good things are happening. Did you know that a self-centered person wouldn't have looked at things that way? They wouldn't have looked. It wouldn't matter if there was a hundred people born again in Caesar's household. What about me? For four years, I've been in uh, unjustly imprisoned. I am being held against my will. I've been shipwrecked. And on and on you could go talking about all of the things that had happened to you. But see, Paul said, it's all worth it because it's turned out rather to the furtherance of the gospel. And then he talked about that there were many people who were mocking him and preaching the gospel out of contention, thinking that that was adding affliction to his bonds. What he means by all of that is saying that there were some people that were saying, oh, have you heard about this? Paul, he believes that there was a guy named Jesus who rose from the dead and that it was actually God in this person. And they were mocking him with their message. But he says, I don't care because people are hearing the truth. And even if a person hears those things said in mockery, the Holy Spirit could take those truths and use it to change somebody's life. And so because of it, he was excited. Again, think about yourself. If people were mocking you and twisting your words and sarcastically mentioning these things, most of us would feel hurt. Paul felt thrilled because it didn't matter whether it was in pretense or in truth. The gospel was being preached. God could use it. In other words, he was so selfless that stick him in the dungeon, do whatever. If people got saved because of it, it was well worth it. And then he goes on to say in Philippians chapter 1, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. It wasn't about Paul. Paul had already died to himself. Paul was dead already. How do you kill a dead man? How do you intimidate a dead man? The reason Paul was so fearless and that he would stand before Caesar or Felix or any of these people and he would stand and boldly proclaim even when he was beaten and stoned and everything else. The reason he could do that is because he had already died to himself. It didn't matter. If preaching the gospel cost him his life, so be it. If preaching the gospel called him to be exalted, so be it. If preaching the gospel called him to be run out of, chain, out of town on a rail, so be it. It didn't matter. He had already dealt with self. There was things more important to him than his comfort and his reputation and these kind of things. And you know what? How do you stop a guy like that? They could say, quit preaching the gospel or we'll kill you. And he'd say, oh, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I mean, he'd just reach up and kiss his jailer right on the forehead like, oh, this is wonderful. I could meet Jesus today. And they'd say, all right, we're going to lock you in jail. And he says, fine, I'll just sit here and praise God. And he gets to praising God. And at midnight, God goes to tapping his foot to the music and an earthquake comes and looses them all and sets them free. And yet Paul didn't leave. 
Because, you know, it didn't matter if he was in the jail or wherever. He was dead to himself. And he got the Philippian jailer born again. And so they say, all right, we're going to let you out. And he says, oh, great. So I'll go out and preach the gospel. Threaten to kill him. Fine with that. Threaten to lock him up. He'll just praise God. Loose him. He'll go preach the gospel. You know what? If you weren't so centered on yourself, you wouldn't be fearful about all these things. I mean, we sing these songs when we all get to heaven. What a day that will be. And then the doctor tells you you're going there and you start crying. You fall apart like a $2 suitcase. You know what? There was more hypocrisy in that than there was reality. When you truly get to where you love God more than yourself, somebody tells you you're going to go meet him. Wonderful. Either I'm going to go today or I'm going to get healed and I'll use this healing to rub the devil's nose in it. And I'll win, but either way I go, I can't lose for winning. I'm blessed. When you quit serving yourself and quit living for yourself and you've got a cause that's bigger than you, you've got a God that is worth laying your life down for. He died for you, so you're going to live for Him. And you love other people, and if you suffering is going to help other people to come to know about the Lord, if... If you're going to suffer criticism, rejection, because you speak out about the Lord and stuff, so be it. But you're going to tell a person the truth. You're going to love them enough to tell them the truth and give them an opportunity to reject the truth on their own rather than you doing it for them. When you get to where you live that way, I tell you what, it just, it, in a sense, puts you in a force field to where Satan can't get at you. Satan has to use this self-centeredness this self-love as an inroad. It's like his beachhead. It's his landing zone. He can't get a toehold if you aren't selfish. It just makes you like Teflon. Everything, nothing sticks. It just all falls off. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, this is the way that God intended for us to live. And this is what he meant when he says, when you lose your life, when you turn it over to me, when you die to yourself, run up a white flag, and say, God, here I am. Whatever I've got, whatever I am or am not, it's all yours. And when you make a commitment like that to God, I guarantee you that's when you really start living. That's when you start succeeding. That's when Satan can't stop you and he can't dominate you and entice you into these things. It's this selfishness that's the source of all of the grief in our life. Man, that is a huge, huge statement, but it's absolutely true. January 26, 2012, in a live event streamed on the ministry website, Andrew announced his decision to build the CBC campus in two stages rather than building it all at once. This is so the 1,000-member student body expected for the 2013 school year will have a building big enough to serve them. The Barn Auditorium with its cafeteria and classrooms will be the perfect solution to this stage of growth. We invite you to go to our website and get the whole story. Click the special message seen below the picture of Andrew and Jamie and watch part one and part two of Andrew's live update. Part one includes the virtual tour of the barn classroom complex. Part two delivers a sneak preview of the main auditorium scheduled to be built after the completion of the barn. But here's the best part. You've already funded 40% of the $20 million needed for the barn expansion. Because of the faithfulness of our friends and partners, we are world changers. Already, our students have made an impact on the nations. Russia, Uganda, Latin America, Europe, Asia, India, and right here at home. But our current campus is already overloaded. We'll be forced to use neighboring facilities to house the school until the barn, auditorium, and classrooms are complete. Think of the graduating classes of the future, 1,000 members strong and more who'll go out year after year to multiply the message of God's unconditional love and grace around the world. Why not join hands with Andrew and JB? and help us complete this much-needed construction as soon as possible. Join the foundation builders who have already given and invest yourself in Karis Bible College and Andrew Womack Ministries today. Write, call, or go to our website to become a foundation builder today.
Our telephone number is 719-635-1111. Our web address is www.awmi.net and our mailing address is on your screen. And don't forget to watch Andrew's special message on the main page of our website. Andrew's complete teaching titled Self-Centeredness, The Source of All Grief is available in a 56-page booklet. You can get your first copy of the booklet free of charge when you go to our website. If you'd like additional copies for yourself and others, they're available for a gift of $2 each. Go to awmi.net and click on today's TV offer to see the options. Or you can get this teaching on CD for a gift of any amount when you write or call. We encourage everyone to give, but for those who could not or would not give anything, Andrew and his partners will provide this CD free of charge. We'd like to remind you that we're offering Andrew's latest book titled Financial Stewardship for a Gift of Any Amount. Contact us today to get your copy. A Spanish version is also available. You can use your credit card to order resources through our website. Go to awmi.net to see the options. While on our website, you can discover more product details and download free additional resources. Or you can order through our helpline Monday through Friday from 4.30 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. Mountain Time. Our helpline number is 719-635-1111. If the lines are busy, you can visit our website where you can order ministry materials 24 hours a day, seven days a week at awmi.net. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. We'd like to point out Andrew's upcoming speaking schedule. Mark your calendars to come meet Andrew at one of these events and let the Word of God transform your life. He'll be in Colorado Springs, Colorado for the annual Summer Family Bible Conference, July 2nd through the 6th, in the New England area for a Gospel Truth Seminar, July 26th through the 28th, and in Chicago, Illinois for a Gospel Truth Seminar, August 16th through the 18th. He'll also be in Toronto and Minneapolis this week for special one-night-only Gospel Truth rallies, June 15th and 16th. For more details on Andrew's next meeting in your area, call our helpline or visit our website at awmi.net. Meet world changers Dannon and Amanda Winter, Karis Bible College graduates, class of 2002. Today, they're founders and directors of Karis Bible College, Florida, with locations in Jacksonville and Orlando. What the school does is it changes people. It transforms them from the inside out. And once those people get changed, then not only do they have a better quality of life, but they can go out and affect other people. We invite you to check out Karis Bible College, Florida. Go to www.floridacbc.org for complete information. Change your life. Change the world.